the mm. Columbia Workshop. Tonight, the Columbia Broadcasting System announces the appointment of William N. Robeson as permanent director of the Columbia Workshop. In keeping with the holiday spirit, Mr. Robeson presents as the first in a new series of workshop productions, part one of his own radio extraction of Lewis Carroll's immortal classic, Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass, with an experimental musical score specially composed for this broadcast by Paul Sterrett and Lee Stevens. Child of the pure, unclouded brow, and dreaming eyes of wonder, so time be fleet, and I and thou are half a life asunder, thy loving smile will surely hail this new tide gift of a fairy tale. Without, the frost, the blinding snow, the storm wind's moody madness. Within, the firelight's ruddy glow, and childhood's nest of gladness. Come, Take this gift from out the past. Come with Alice through the looking glass. Alice sat drowsily in the great armchair as the snowflakes fell gently against the window pane. Just as if they were kissing it, Alice thought. The black kitten, lying in her lap, purred in the warmth of a fire. And sleepily, Alice wondered. Kitty, can you play chess? Now, don't smile. I'm asking it seriously. Because when Sister and I were playing a little while ago, you watched just as if you understood. And when I said check, you purred. Well, it was a nice check, Kitty. And really, I might have won if it hadn't been for that nasty knife that came wriggling down among my pieces. <sighs> Kitty, dear, let's pretend that you're the Red Queen. Oh, yes, you do know who the Red Queen is. She's one of my chessmen. I'm sure if you sat up and folded your arms, you'd look exactly like her. Now, do try it. But the kitten wouldn't try. So to punish it, Alice held it up to the looking glass so it might see how sulky it was. And if you're not good directly, I'll put you through the mirror in the looking glass house. How would you like that? Very well, then. Mind your manners. And now, if you'll attend and not talk so much, I'll tell you my ideas about looking glass house. First, there's the room you can see through the glass. That's just the same as our drawing room. Only the things go the other way. The books are something like our books, too. Only the words go the wrong way. I know that because I've held up one of our books to the glass. And then they hold up one in the other room. And, Kitten, you can just see a little peep of the passage in Looking Glass House if you leave the door of our drawing room wide open. And it's very like our passage, as far as you can see. Only you don't know. It may be quite different beyond. There must be a garden and, oh, so many lovely things. Oh, Kitty, how nice it would be if we could get through into Looking Glass House. Let's pretend there's a way of getting through somehow, Kitty. Let's pretend the glass has got all soft like gauze, so that we can get through. Why, I declare, it's turning into a sort of mist. It'll be easy enough to get through now. Certainly the glass was beginning to melt away, just like a bright, silvery mist. In a moment, Alice was up on the mantelpiece, through the glass, and had jumped lightly down into the looking glass room. Oh, uh, my, my, 
why they don't keep this room so tidy as the other. All the chessmen spilled among the cinders on the hearth. What? They're moving. They've come to life. The Red King and the Red Queen. And there is a White King and the White Queen sitting on the edge of the shovel. And here are two castles walking arm in arm. But Alice was too experienced a Wonderland traveler to marvel much at the chessmen come to life. And she quickly ran through looking that house, searching for the garden. When she came to the stairs, she discovered a new invention for getting down quickly. She just kept the tips of her fingers on the handrail and floated gently down without even touching the stairs with her feet. She floated on through the hall and would have gone straight out the door the same way if she hadn't caught hold of the doorpost. But at last, she was in a garden full of days and roses and violets and tiger lilies with a willow tree growing in the middle. Alice paused and quite naturally spoke to the tiger lily. Oh, tiger lily, I wish you could talk. We can talk. Then is anybody worth talking to? And can all the flowers talk? As well as you can, and a great deal louder. It is a matter for us to begin, you know. And I really was wondering when you did I do myself? The thing is just some sense in it, so it's not a clever one. Still, you are the right color, and that goes a long way. I don't care about the color, though. If only her petals curled up a little more, she'd be all right. Um, uh, aren't you sometimes frightened at being planted out here with nobody to take care of you? There's a tree in the middle. What else is it good for? But what could it do if any danger came? It could book. It says bow wow. That's why it's planted to the call bow. That's right, Daisy. Didn't you know that? Why, uh, it hadn't occurred. <laughs> Diamond, every one of you. <laughs> they know I can't get at them, or they wouldn't dare to do that. Never mind, Tiger Lily. Now, Daisy, if you don't hold your tongue, I'll pick you. <laughs> There must be another little girl in the garden somewhere. Oh, she's one of the thorny kind. She's coming. It's the Red Queen. She's grown a great deal. When I saw her in the ashes a few minutes ago, she was only three inches tall. And now she's half a head taller than me. It's the fresh air that does it. Wonderful be fine air is out here. I think I'll go and meet her. Oh, no, 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 you can't possibly do that. I should advise you to walk the other way. This sounded like utter nonsense to Alice, so she set off at once toward the Red Queen. But in a moment, her Red Majesty disappeared, and Alice found herself walking into the door of the looking glass house again. There was nothing to do but try the plan suggested by the rose. So she started walking off in the opposite direction from where she had seen the tree. It worked beautifully. For a moment later, she found herself face to face with the monarch. Where do you come from? Where are you going? Look up, speak nicely, and don't twiddle your fingers all the time. Please, Your Majesty, I came through the looking glass. And I don't know where I'm going because I've lost my way. I don't know what you mean by your way. All the ways about here belong to me. But why did you come out here at all? Curtsy while you're thinking what to say. It saves time. You've had long enough now. Open your mouth a little wider when you speak. And always say, Your Majesty. I only wanted to see what the garden was like. Your Majesty? That's right. Delivery excellent. Posture fair. But as for subject matter, I can't give you as much. Now it's a garden. When you say garden, I've seen gardens compared to which this would be a wilderness. I thought I'd try to find my way to the top of that hill. Your when you Ma say hill... I could show you hills in comparison with which you'd call this a valley. No, I shouldn't. A hill can't be a valley, you know. That would be nonsense. You may call it nonsense if you like. But I've heard nonsense compared with which that would be as sensible as a dictionary. Alice stretched it again for fear she had offended the Red Queen. And they walked on a bit until they came to the top of the little hill. A most curious country stretched out from the top of this hill. It was all divided into squares by tiny green hedges which bordered tiny little brooks flowing in straight lines across it. 
I declare, it's marked out just like a large chessboard. Now, there ought to be some men moving about somewhere. Look for yourself. Yonder on the horizon, the red knight is capturing the white bishop. Why, it's a great, huge game of chess that... being played all over the world, if this is the world, you know. Oh, what fun! How oh, I wish I were one of them. I wouldn't mind even being a pawn if I could only join... So, of course, I would like to be a queen, Bet. That's easily managed. You could be the white queen's pawn if you like, as Lily, her daughter, is too young to play. And you're in the second square to begin with. So when you get to the eighth square, you'll be a queen. Uh, if you're not captured... Is there any danger of being captured? Danger! There's always danger. And just at this moment, the Red Queen grabbed Alice's hand and began to run like mad. And as fast as poor Alice ran, the Queen kept urging... Faster! Faster! The most curious part of the thing was that the trees and the other things around them never changed their places at all. However fast they went, they never seemed to pass anything. I wonder if the things move along with us. Faster! Don't try to talk! and began measuring the ground and sticking little pegs in here and there while Alice choked on the biscuit. At the end of two yards, I shall give you your direction. <laughs> Have another biscuit? No, thank you. One, quite enough. Thirst quenched, I hope. <laughs> At the end of three yards, I shall repeat the directions for fear of your forgetting them. At the end of four, I shall say goodbye. And at the end of five, I shall go. So, I proceed to the two-yard page. A pawn goes two squares in its first move, you know. So you go very quickly through the third square, a by railway, I should think, and you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Well, that square belongs to Tweedledee and Tweedledum. The fifth is mostly water. The sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty. But you make no remark. I... I didn't know I had to make one just then. You should have said, it's extremely kind of you to tell me this. However, we'll assume it to be said. The seventh square is all for it, but one of the knights will show you the way. And in the eighth square, we shall all be queens, and it's all feasting and fun. I proceed to the three-yard pay. Speak in fresh when you can't think of English for a thing. Turn out your toes as you walk, and remember who you are. I proceed to the four-yard tank. Goodbye. I proceed to the five-yard tank. At the last peg, the Red Queen was gone, instantly vanished. And Alice, remembering that she was a pawn in this vast game of chess, realized that it was her move, and the third square was her objective. So she ran down the hill, and when she came to the first of the roof, she jumped. Tickets, please. Hi. Have your tickets ready. Hi. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now. Helen, show your ticket, child. Don't keep him waiting, child. His time is worth a thousand pounds a minute. I'm afraid I haven't got a ticket. There wasn't a ticket office where I came from. There wasn't room for one. 
such nonsense. So the voices didn't answer her this time, although to her great surprise they fought in chorus. I hope you understand what this is like, but I'm sure I don't. All the time the passengers joined in silent unison, the train guard was looking at Alice, first through a telescope, then through a microscope, and then through opera glasses. At last, he said, You are traveling the wrong way. companions were a queer group. There was a gentleman sitting opposite her dressed in white paper, and next to him a goat wearing eyeglasses, and next to the goat a beetle. There were others too, but Alice couldn't see them because the carriage was so dark. So young a child ought to know which way she's going, even if she doesn't know her own name. Ah, she ought to know her way to the ticket office, even if she doesn't know her alphabet. She'll have to go back from here as luggage. Change engines at <laughs> That sounds like a horse. You might make a joke on that. Something about horse and sore throat, you know. He must be labeled last with care, you know. She must go by post. Say she's got a hand on her. She must be sent as a message by telegraph. She must draw the train the rest of the way. Never mind what they all say, my dear. I take a return ticket every time the train stops. Indeed, I shan't. I don't belong to this railway journey at all. I was in a wood just now, and I don't know how I got there, and I wish I were back there. <laughs> you might make a joke on that. Something about you would if you could, you know. Don't tease so. If you're so anxious to have a joke made, why don't you make one yourself? of an insect. What? And you don't like insects? Oh, dear. Oh, dear. <laughs> Nothing to get upset about. Nothing at all. Just a book. We have to jump over. I scarcely like the idea of a jumping train. Nothing to worry about, child. Well, it will take us into the fourth square, and that's some comfort. Oh, hold on, everyone. Stop! <laughs> Alice felt the carriage rise straight up into the air, and in her fright she caught hold of the goat's beard. But the beard melted away as she touched it, and she found herself sitting in the middle of a wood. A few feet away, standing motionless, were two fat little men, each with his arm around the other's neck. It was evident at once which was which, for one had the word dumb embroidered on his collar, and the other the word D. Tweedle's dumb and Tweedle's D. I suppose the word tweedles embroidered around the back of their collars. My, how they stare. It's scarcely polite. If you think we're waxworks, you ought to pay, you know. Waxworks weren't made to be looked at for nothing. No, how? Contrarywise, if you think we're alive, you ought to speak. I'm sure I'm very sorry. I know what you're thinking about. So do I. What? That horrid, horrid song. song. Tweedle's dumb and Tweedle's D agreed to have a battle. For Tweedle's dumb said Tweedle's D had spoiled his nice new rattle. The then grew down a monstrous crow, as black as a tarbarrow, which frightened both the heroes so they quite forgot their quarrel. Now, that's what, what you were thinking, thinking about, weren't it? Well, yes. It isn't so, no how. Contrarywise, if it was so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. 
But if it isn't, it ain't. That's lucky. <laughs> they look so exactly like a couple of big schoolboys. <laughs> First boy. No, huh? Next boy. Contrary wise. You've begun wrong. The first thing in the school visit is to say, how do you do? And shake hands. As the two brothers were hugging each other, they held out the two hands that were free to shake hands with Alice. Alice didn't want to shake hands with either of them first for fear of hurting the other's feelings. So she took hold of both their hands at once. And immediately, the three of them started dancing round and round in a ring and singing... Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush so early in the morning. Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. I don't want to dance no more, no. Contrary, wise. Four times round is enough for one dance. I hope you're not much tired. No, how? And thank you very much for asking. Uh, so much obliged. Do you like poetry? Yes. Pretty well. Some poetry. But now perhaps you can tell me which road leads out of the woods. What shall I repeat to her? The well, walrus and the carpenter is the longest. If it's very long, would you please tell me first which road... It sounds is... worse if you sing it. Contrary, wise, it couldn't sound worse if I sang it. <laughs> <laughs> The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, As she said, to come and spoil the fun. The walrus and the carpenter were walking close at hand. They went like anything to see such quantities of sand. If this were only cleared away, they said, it would be grand. If seven maids with seven mops swept it for half a year, do you suppose... The walrus said... That they could get it clear? I doubt it. Said the carpenter and shed a bitter tear. Oysters, come and walk with us. The walrus did beseech. A pleasant walk, a pleasant talk. Along the briny beach. We cannot do with more than four to give a hand to each. The eldest oyster looked at him, but never a word he said. The eldest oyster winked his eye and shook his heavy head, meaning to say he did not choose to leave the oyster bed. But four young oysters hurried up, all eager for the treat. Their coats were brushed, their faces washed, their shoes were clean and neat. And this was odd because, you know, they hadn't any feet. Four other oysters followed them, and yet another four, and thick and fast they came at last, and more and more and more, all hopping through the frothy waves and scrambling to the shore. The time has come, as the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and silly wax, of cabbages and kings, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Uh, the oysters cried. Before we have our chat. No hurry, said the carpenter. They thanked him much for that. A loaf of bread, the walrus said, is what we chiefly need. Pepper and vinegar, besides, are very good indeed. Now, if you're ready, oysters, dear, we can begin to feed. The oysters cried, turning a little blue. The walrus said. Do you admire the view? It was so nice of you to come. And you are very nice. And the carpenter said nothing, but... Cut us another slice. I wish you were not quite so deaf. I've had to ask you twice. It seems a shame. Uh, the walrus said. To play them such a trick. After we brought them out so far. And made them trot so quick. And the carpenter said nothing, oh, but... The body spread too thick. I weep for you. The walrus said. I deeply sympathize. With sobs and tears, he <laughs> sorted out those of the larger size, <laughs> holding his pocket handkerchief before his streaming eyes. Oh, oysters, said the carpenter. You've had a pleasant run. Shall we be trotting home again? But answer came to none. And this was scarcely odd because they'd eaten every one. I like the walrus best. 
Because, you see, he was a little sorry for the poor oyster. He ate more than the carpenter, though. You see, he held his handkerchief in front so that the carpenter couldn't count how many he took. Contrary, wise. Oh, that was me. Then I liked the carpenter best if he didn't be so many as the walrus. But he ate as many as he could get. Well, then, they were both very unpleasant characters. But I'd better be getting out of the woods, for really it's coming on very dark. Do you think it's going to rain? Put up the umbrella, Tweedledee, and see. Oh, yes, there. No, I don't think it's going to rain. At least not under here, contrary wise. Well, may if it chooses. We've no objection. No, how? Selfish thing. If it did rain, they'd be sure to keep the umbrella to themselves. Well, good night. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Do you see that? What? Under the tree there. Oh, it's only a rattle. Not a rattlesnake, you know. Only an old rattle. Quite old and broken. I knew it. I knew it. It's spoiled, of course. You needn't be so angry about an old rattle. But it isn't old. It's new, I tell you. I bought it yesterday. Ah, <laughs> oh, my nice new rattle. <laughs> you may want it right under your umbrella, brother. <laughs> ah, you may well keep it open and close your eyes like a great fish. Oh, you, you spoiler of rattles. I, I, I didn't. A contrary wife. Of course, you agree to have a battle. I suppose so. Only she must help her fish, you know. I think, of course, you know. Wait here, you. Oh, we do dumb and we do be at least to have a battle. So the two brothers went off arm in arm into the wood and returned in a minute with their arms full of things, such as bolsters, blankets, hearth rugs, tablecloths, dish covers, and coal scuttles. Well, I hope you're good hand at pinning and tying strings. Every one of these things has to go on somehow or other. Uh, here, you uh, tie this bolster around my neck to keep my head from being cut off. Really, you would both be more like bundles of old clothes than anything else by the time you're ready to fight. You know, it's one of the most serious things that can possibly happen to one in a battle to get one's head cut off. Uh, uh, here, uh, tie my helmet on. But this is only a saucepan. Contrary, why is it my helmet? Do I look very pale? Well, yes, a little. I'm very brave, generally. Only today I happen to have a toothache. Yeah. No, and, and I've got a bad headache. Yeah, I'm far worse off than you. Then you'd better not fight today. We must have a bit of a fight, but I don't care about going on long. What's the time now? Half for four. Well, let's fight the six and then have dinner. Very well. Uh, and she can watch us. Uh, only you better not come very close. I generally hit everything I can see when mm. I... Really get excited. And I hit everything within reach, whether I can see it or not. You must hit the tree pretty often, I should think. Well, I don't suppose there'll be a tree left standing for ever so far around by the time we finish. And all about a rattle. I shouldn't have minded it so much if it hadn't been a new one. She always breaks my new one. I'm very wise, I never. There's only one sword. You know, brother, but you can have the umbrella... Quite a shot. Hmm? Only you mustn't stick me with it. Promise? You mustn't cut me with your sword. Promise? I promise. You promise? I promise. Then we can begin our battle. And we better be quick about it. It's getting darker as it can. Hmm? Darker? There must be a thunderstorm coming on. Look what a thick black cloud that is. And how fast it comes. What? I do believe it's got wings. Oh, brother, it's a monstrous crow. Hurry. I want it, brother. Wait for me. Wait for me. Wait. Oh, oh dear, they're out of sight. It's all very well for them. The song says the crow scared them quite away. But the song doesn't say anything about me. What shall I do? What shall I do? Lester should worry about Alice's predicament over the Christmas weekend. She is in no grave danger and will be able to hide safely away until next Thursday evening at the same time when we will follow her further adventures through the looking glass. Through the looking glass was extracted for radio by William N. Robeson, who also directed the production. The special musical score was composed by Lee Stevens and Paul Starrett, and Mr. Stevens conducted the orchestra. Alice was played by Miss Helen Clare.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Columbia Workshop. Tonight, in presenting the second part of its radio extraction of Lewis Carroll's fantasy, Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass, the Columbia Workshop continues an experiment begun last autumn when it presented Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. These classics are being broadcast in an effort to determine just how far music can substitute for sound effects. In tonight's presentation, as was the case last week, all sound effects are executed by orchestral instruments and are a part of the musical score especially written for the broadcast by Leith Stevens and Paul Starrett. The Columbia Workshop wants to know how successful this experimental broadcast has been. We welcome your comments, suggestions, and criticism. <laughs> The Columbia Workshop presents Through the Looking Glass. Alice had been playing Let's Pretend again. And while she was pretending that the black kitten was really the Red Queen in her chess set, and that she really could get through the mirror into the Looking Glass house, it happened. and she found herself walking through the looking glass and out into a lovely garden where the flowers talked and where she met the Red Queen who instructed her how to travel across the land that looks like a chessboard. You'll go very quickly through the third square, by railway, I should think, and you'll find yourself in the fourth square in no time. Well, that square belongs to Tweedledee and Tweedledum. The fifth is mostly water. The sixth belongs to Humpty Dumpty. The seventh is all forest, but the white knight will show you the way. And in the eighth square, we shall all be queens, and it's all feasting and fun. So Alice ran down the hill, jumped a little brook, and found herself in a railway station. No sooner had the train pulled out, and it jumped too. And Alice was in the fourth square with Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Way down, back, way down, day. And the monstrous crow did frighten the heroes, and poor Alice was left all alone, hiding under a tree. As the great bird went flying by, its wings kicking up a hurricane which blew someone's shawl right past her. Alice caught it, and while she was looking for the owner, the white queen came running along, arms stretched out wide. Oh, my shawl! My shawl! Here you are, ma'am. Uh, may I help you put it on, ma'am? Uh, your Majesty? For I am addressing the white queen, aren't I? Well, yes, if you call that a dressing, it's... Isn't my notion of a thing at all? Here, let me do it. Oh, 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 oh dear! My finger is bleeding. Oh. What's the matter? Have you picked it? No, I haven't picked it yet, but soon I shall. Oh! When do you expect to do it? When I find it back in my shawl. The brooch will come undone directly. Oh, well, now there, what did I tell you? It's open now. Oh, take care! You're holding it all crooked. And there, it's quick, me, see? You know, that's the cell for the bleeding. But why don't you scream now? Why, I've done all the screaming already. But that's all backwards. First, you should prick your finger, and then scream. That's so perfectly silly. I should fall that way backwards. Well, in any case, I hope your finger's better now. No, oh, much better. Better, better, better. Alice looked at the white queen in astonishment. Then she rubbed her eyes and looked again. She was in a little dark shop, leaning with her elbows on the counter, and opposite her was an old sheep, 
sitting in an armchair, knitting, and every now and then leaving off to look at her through a great pair of spectacles. Oh, you must buy something. You're holding everybody up. Why, there's no one else here but me. Indeed. Oh, Lord, you know about it. What do you want to buy? Well, do you have any eggs? Certainly. How do you sell them? Of course, the counter in exchange for money. I mean, how much are they? Five cents farthing for one. Two cents for two. Then two are cheaper than one? Certainly. Only you must eat them both if you buy two. Oh, then I'll have one, please. Why, I might not like them, you know. Here's your money. But where's my egg? Oh, I never put things into people's hands. That would never do. You must get it for yourself. It's yonder on a shelf at the back of the store. <laughs> I wonder why it wouldn't do. Couldn't it? The egg seems to get further away the more I walk toward it. And it's so dark back here. Oh, this must be a chair I'm running into. What? Well, I declare it's got branches. How odd to find trees growing in a shop. And actually, here's a little book. Well, this is the queerest shop I ever saw. So she went on, wondering more and more at every step, as everything turned into a tree the moment she came up to it. And she quite expected the egg to do the same. However, the egg only got larger and larger and more and more human. When she'd come within a few yards of it, she saw that it had eyes and a nose and mouth. And when she'd come quite close to it, she saw clearly that it was Humpty Dumpty himself. It can't be anybody else. Sitting there on the wall... And certainly he is exactly like an egg. It's very provoking to be called an egg, very. I said you look like an egg, sir. And some eggs are very pretty, you know. Some people have no more sense than a baby. State your name, address, and occupation. My name is Alice, but... It's a stupid name enough. What does it mean? Must the name mean something? Why, of course it must. My name means the shape I am. And a good handsome shape it is, too. With a name like yours... <laughs> You might be any shape, almost. There's glory for you. I don't know what you mean by glory. Well, of course you don't, till I tell you. I mean, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Nothing more, nor less. The question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is which is to be master, that's all. For instance... Would you like to hear a song in which words really work over time? Oh, yes, indeed. Was really And the slightly cold Did dire and gimble In the wave of Mimsy Where the pearl grows And the warm Outrage. Beware the Jabberwock, my son, with jaws that bite the claws that catch. Beware the Jubjub bird and son of Plumia Bandersnatch. He took his horrible sword in hand. Long time the manxum foe he sought, so rested he. By the tub tub tree and stood a while in thought. And as in selfish thought he stood, the Jabberwock with eyes of flame came whistling through the cozy wood and burbled as he came. One, two, one, two, and two, and two, the vorpal blade went snicker smack. He left it dance, and with it is, he went galumping back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Come to my arms, my Phoenix boy, or brave to stay, to lose, to lay, he cartoon in his joy. was really, 
And the slimy toads did gyre and gimble in the wave. All men see where the boro bows and the moon rest out. <laughs> My, how well, what do you think of that? I'm sorry, but it doesn't seem to make much sense. Sense? Why, it makes perfect sense. I don't know the meaning of half the word. Oh, you don't know the meaning? Well, that doesn't prove it doesn't make sense. Although I will agree, there are some hard words there. Brillig, for instance. Now, Brillig means four o'clock in the afternoon. The time you begin broiling things for dinner. Then what does slithy mean? Well, slithy means live and slimy. Live is the same as active. You see, it's like a portmanteau. There are two meanings packed up in one word. Oh, I see it now. And what are toves? Well, toves are something like badgers. There's something like lizards. And there's something like corkscrews. They must be very mm. joyous-looking creatures. They are, but also they make their nests under sun dust. Also, they live on cheese. And what to gyre and to gimble? To gyre is to go round and round like a gyroscope. Gimble is to make holes like a gimbal. And... The wave is the grass track round a sundial, I suppose? Of course it is. It's called wave, you know, because it goes a long way before it and a long way behind it. And a long way beyond it on each side. Exactly so. Well, flimsy means flimsy and miserable. There's another portmanteau for you. And a bar of gold is a thin, shabby-looking bird with its feathers sticking out all around. It's something like a live mop. And then... Mom, rat. Well, a rat is a sort of green pink. But mom, I'm not certain about. I think it's short for from home. Meaning that they'd lost their way, you know. And what does outgrade mean? Outgriving is something between bellowing and whistling. With a kind of sneeze in the middle. Uh, however, you'll hear it done maybe someday. Then you'll never forget it. I'm afraid I'm giving you a great deal of trouble. Indeed you are. Good day. And Humpty Dumpty shut his eyes. Alice waited a minute to see if he would speak again, but as he never opened his eyes or took any further notice of her, she said goodbye a couple of times, and getting no answer, she quietly walked away. But she couldn't help saying to herself as she went, Of all the unsatisfactory... She repeated this out loud as it was a great comfort to have such a long word to say. Of all the unsatisfactory people I ever met... She never finished the sentence... For at this moment, Alice's thoughts were interrupted. A knight, dressed in crimson armor, came galloping down upon her, brandishing a great club. A horse! A horse! Church! <laughs> You're my prisoner. You're my... The red knight had tumbled off his horse, so Alice looked around with some concern for the new enemy. This time it was a white knight. He drew up at Alice's side and tumbled off his horse, too. The two knights sat and looked at each other for some time without speaking. Alice looked from one to the other in some bewilderment. She's my prisoner, you know. Yes, but then I came and rescued her. Well, we must fight for her then. Put on your helmet. Why, they're helmets for the shape of a horse's head. Uh, you will observe the rules of battle, of course. I always do. <laughs> wonder now what the rules of battle are. One rule seems to be that if one knight hits the other, he knocks him off his horse. And if he misses, he tumbles off himself. And another rule seems to be that they hold their clubs with their arms, as if they were parts of duty. What a noise they make when they tumble. Just like a whole set of fire iron falling into the fender. And how quiet the horses are. They let them get on and off them just as if they were tables. Another rule of battle that Alice had not noticed seemed to be that they always fell on their heads. And the battle ended with their both falling off in this way, side by side. When they got up again, they shook hands. And then the Red Knight mounted and galloped off. It was a glorious victory, wasn't it? I don't know. I don't want to be anybody's prisoner. I want to be a queen. But so you will, when you've crossed the next brook. 
I'll see you safe to the end of the wood, and then I must go back, you know. That's the end of my move. Thank you very much. May I help you off with your helmet? <laughs> ah, thank you. Ah, now one can breathe more easily. Alice thought she had never seen such a strange-looking soldier in all her life. He pushed back his shaggy hair with both hands and turned his gentle face and large, mild eyes to Alice. He was dressed in tin armor, which seemed to fit him very badly, and he had a queer-shaped little deal box fastened across his shoulders, upside down, and with the lid hanging open. Alice looked at it with great curiosity. I see you're admiring my little box. It's my own invention to keep clothes and sandwiches in. Upside down, so that the rain can't get in. But the things can get out. Do you know the lid, Dorothy? Oh, oh, I didn't know it. But then all the things must have fallen out. And the box is no use without them. Then why are you hanging it so carefully on the tree? In hopes some bees may make a nest in it. Then I should get the honey. But you've got a beehive. Or something like one fastened to the saddle. Yes, and it's a very good beehive. One of the best kinds. But not a single bee has come near it yet. And the other thing is a mouse trap. I suppose the mice keep the bees out or the bees keep the mice out. I, I don't know which. I was wondering what the mouse trap was for. It isn't very likely there would be any mice on the horse's back. Not very likely, perhaps. But if they do come, I don't choose to have them running all around. Now, you see, it is well to be provided for everything. That's the reason the horse has all those anchors around his feet. But what are they for? Uh, to guard against the bites of sharks. It's an invention of my own. And now, uh, help me on. I'll go with you to the end of the wood. It took a long time to get the knight in his saddle because he was so very awkward. And because the saddle was already loaded with bunches of carrots and fire irons and many other things. But at last they accomplished it and started off through the forest. Whenever the horse stopped, which it did very often, he fell off in front. And whenever it went on again, which it generally did rather suddenly, he fell off behind. Otherwise, he kept on pretty well, except that he had a habit of now and then falling off sideways. And as he generally did this on the side on which Alice was walking, she soon found that it was the best plan not to walk quite so close to the horse. As Alice helped the white knight up the fifth time, she ventured to say, I'm afraid you've not had much practice in riding. Now, what makes you say that? Because people don't fall off quite so often when they've had much practice. I've had plenty of practice. Plenty of practice. Indeed. The great art of riding is to keep... Here the sentence ended as suddenly as it had begun, as the knight fell heavily on the top of his head exactly in the path where Alice was walking. She was quite frightened this time and said in an anxious tone as she picked him up. Oh, I hope no bones are broken. No, none to speak of. The great art of riding, as I was saying, is to keep your balance properly. Like this, you know. He let go the bridle and stretched out both his arms to show Alice what he meant. And this time he fell flat on his back, right under the horse's feet. As Alice was getting him on his feet again, he kept repeating... Plenty of practice. Plenty of practice. Oh, it's too ridiculous. You ought to have a wooden horse on wheels. That you are. Uh, does that kind go smoothly? Much more smoothly than a live horse. I- I'll get one. One or two. Several. I'm a great hand at inventing things. Now, uh, I dare say you noticed the last time you picked me up that I was looking rather thoughtful. You were a little gray. Well, just then, I was inventing a new way of getting over a gate. Uh, would you like to hear it? Oh, very much indeed. You see, I said to myself, the only difficulty is with the feet. Now, the head is high enough already. Now, first, I put my head on top of the gate. Then the head's high enough. Then I stand on my head. And then the feet are high enough, you see. Then, <clears throat> I'm over, you see. Yes. I suppose you'd be over when that was done, but don't you think it would be rather hard? Well, I haven't tried it yet, so I can't tell for certain. But, oh, you want to get along Perhaps I'd better leave. Oh, you needn't rush off. Oh, but I must. And you've only a few yards to go, down the hill, and over to that little brook, and then you'll be a queen. Uh, But you'll stay and see me off first. I I shan't be long. You'll wait and wave your handkerchief when I get to that turn in the road. Oh, I think it'd encourage me, you see. Of course I'll wait. And 
thank you very much for coming so far. So they shook hands and in the night rode slowly away into the forest. It won't take long to see him off, I expect. So Alice stood watching the horse walking leisurely along the road and the night tumbling off, first on one side and then on the other. After the fourth or fifth tumble, he reached the turn and then she waved her handkerchief to him and waited till he was out of sight. Then she turned around and started to run down the hill. I hope it encouraged him. And now for the last brook and to be a queen. How grand it sounds. And Alice ran the western way down the hill, and when she came to the little brook, she jumped. And found herself standing before a great arched doorway on which the words Queen Alice were carved, and on the other side of which she heard voices singing. In her hand she carried a scepter, and on her head she wore a great golden crown. She was indeed at last a queen, but a slightly puzzled one, for at either side of the great door was a bell, and one was marked Visitor's Bell, and the other Servant's Bell. Hmm. Now which bell shall I ring? I'm not a visitor, and I'm not a servant. There ought to be one marked queen, you know. Oh, it's all right. Someone's opening it. No admittance till we got the next. Oh, the impertinence. And Alice knocked and rang in vain for a long time. Until at last the very old frog who was sitting under a tree got up and slowly hobbled up to her. <clears throat> what is it now? There's the servant whose business it is to answer this door. Which door? This door, of course. What's it been asking? <clears throat> I don't know what you mean. I speak English, doesn't I? Or are you deaf? What did it ask you? Nothing. I've been knocking at it. Shouldn't do that. Shouldn't do that at all. Wax it, you know. Let it alone, and it'll let you alone. But just at this moment, the door flew open of its own accord, and Alice looked in on the banquet hall, just as another song began. I've a scepter in hand, I've a crown on my head, let a look at a creature, whatever they be, come down with the red queen, the white queen on me. And feel of the glasses as sweet as you can, and sweet on the table with bottles and bread, with cats in the coffee and ice in the tea, and welcome Queen Alice. appeared, the cheering stopped, and all the guests, birds and beasts and flowers, watched Alice in silence as she took her place between the Red Queen and the White Queen at the head of the table. It's nice of you to give my party for me, Your Red Majesty. I should never have known who were the right people to invite. You've missed the soup and fish. Put on the joint. 
Your own spear, Your Majesty. You look a little shy. Let me introduce you to this leg of mutton. Alice, mutton. Mutton, Alice. And the leg of mutton got up in the dish and made a little bow to Alice. And Alice returned the bow, not quite sure whether this was the right thing to do or not. May I, uh, give you a slice, Your Majesty? Certainly not. It isn't etiquette to cut anyone you've been introduced to. Remove the joints and bring on the pudding. I won't be introduced to the pudding, please. Oh, we shall get no dinner at all. The, 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 the pudding, Your Majesty. Pudding, Alice. Alice, pudding. Remove the pudding. Waiter, bring back the pudding. The, the, the pudding, Your Majesty. Now, Your Majesty, here is a slice of pudding for you. What impertinence. I wonder how you'd like it if I were to cut a slice out of you, you little creature. Why, uh, uh, make a remark. It's ridiculous to leave all the conversation to the pudding. What shall I say? Nothing. We'll drink your health instead. Queen Alice's health! You ought to return thanks in a neat speech. But... Sir? Oh, I'm good. Very well. I rise to return thanks. And Alice really did rise. As she spoke, she felt herself grow several inches. And she just managed to pull herself down by the edge of the table. Take care of yourself. Something's going to happen. And something did happen. Many things. The candles grew until they became huge fireworks, and the bottles took place and fixed them on his wings, and with forks for legs began fluttering around the room. And the leg of mutton usurped the white queen's chair, while Alice just had a glimpse of her majesty's good-natured face grinning at her over the edge of the soup tureen before she disappeared for the third time into the soup. Something had to be done, for several of the guests were lying in the dishes, and the soup tureen was walking up the table toward Alice, beckoning her impatiently to get out of the way. Oh, I can't stand this any longer! And she seized the tablecloth with both hands and gave it a good pull. And guests and dishes and plates and candles came crashing down in a heap on the floor. Alice turned to look for the Red Queen, whom she considered somehow to be the cause of it all, but Her Majesty had dwindled to the size of a doll and was running merrily around the table after her own chore. Alice grabbed her up. As for you, I'll shake you if you kitten, I will. She took the Red Queen off the table and shook her back and forth with all her might. The Red Queen made no resistance whatever. Only her face grew very small, and her eyes got large and green. And still, as Alice kept on shaking her, she kept growing shorter and fatter and softer and rounder. And it really was a kitten after all. Columbia Workshop's presentation of Through the Looking Glass, which was extracted for radio and directed by William N. Robeson. The special musical score was composed by Lee Stevens and Paul Starrett, and Miss Helen Clare played Alice. We want to know what you think of this program. Please address your comments, criticisms, and suggestions to the Columbia Workshop, care of the Columbia Network, New York City. Beginning next week, the Columbia Workshop will be heard on Saturday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Don't forget the Workshop's new series of experimental broadcasts begins a week from Saturday, January 8th, at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.